Amen. All right, go to Ephesians chapter 2. Um, we got lots of work today. I'm not messing around, people. Let's go. Um, get out your Bibles. We're going to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And last week, if you were here with us, Ephesians chapter 1 was like this long poem and almost song that Paul sang to us about the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the way that we got saved. As we go into chapter 2, I'll tell you this. There are about three different spots in today's passage that are classic verses that you've heard a thousand times, probably growing up or in church. They're just massive moments of truth in the Bible where Paul says something that he doesn't say in the same way other places, and he just helps us understand. So you're going to see those as we go. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Verse 3, all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. So he's starting here in this spot by letting us know he's talking to Christians. He's talking to people who used to be lost. They used to be dead in their sins. And this is big kind of extreme language from Paul, but he's talking to Christians and this is, this is their testimony. He's saying, you used to be in this place and now you're in a better place. He's about to tell us about the better place that we're in. But you got to start with where we were. Because to tell us, to tell the story of where we were is to tell the full story of God in us. So you have to begin there. And we were dead. That's, that's big language. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says that we were blind before Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans 6 says that we were a slave to sin. We did everything sin told us to do. John 3 said that we were lovers of darkness. Mark 2 said that we were spiritually, morally, and relationally sick before Jesus. And then in Luke 15, Jesus said that we're lost without him. Verse 4, but God. I love but God. Amen. Right? Like there's moments in the scripture where the entire gospel is said in such a small number of words, but God is so rich in mercy. He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Verse six, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and he seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united in Christ or with Christ. And so verse seven, here's one of these big verses that I told you about. So God can point to us in all future ages ex as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united in Christ Jesus. Now that's a lot of words, but look at what he's saying. He's saying that if you're in Christ today, the story of where you were and how you found Jesus and what Jesus has now done in your life, that story, that testimony is the word that we often use in the church. That testimony God is going to point to it, not just now. God's going to point to it in future generations as a way to help others find Jesus Christ. This is massive, amen? And this is talking about the way that your kids might reach Jesus through you or your grandkids or other people in the community. And it goes on and on and on. Maybe even in heaven, you'll be sharing your testimony with the angels. I think it's a cool idea, personally. Ephesians 2, 8. Um, but God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Again, this is one of those big passages that you hear over and over. I, I, I memorized this as a, as a teenager in this way. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is not by works so that no one can boast. Amen. And this is just said in, in the NLT, just a, a, a way to, for you to more easily understand. But let me pull something out here real quick. Salvation is not a reward for the good things. The good things is this Greek word called ergon. Say ergon. Ergon, ergon it means, it means the, the work or the deeds that you do. 
And it's important that we realize that because this is the mindset of all religions ever, for all time, across the globe, is that we are distant from God and religion comes in and says, you've got to figure out a way to elevate yourself to where God is. And if you can elevate yourself through your work, your hard work to where God is, then you will be with God. Then you will be right. Then you will be okay and saved. But religion is wrong. And right here it says it, it's not through the works that you do. Now, why is it not through the works that we do? Number one, because you can't. You're just not smart enough. You're just not good enough. You're not strong enough in order to work hard enough to get your way to God. Not even Mother Teresa was. Not even Billy Graham was. Not even the Pope is. So Jesus had to save all of us, including them including people that many of us consider saints, God had to save them through his death on the cross. That's the only way they could ever make it. So first reason that religion is wrong is because we can't. But the second reason that religion is wrong is because if anyone follows that path of trying to elevate themselves to God, guess what they get at the end? They get ego. They get pride. And they get boasting. Because I'm the one who lifted myself up by my own bootstraps to God. And as soon as I do that, I get the credit for it. And he says, no, you don't. You don't get any of the credit. And so boasting is gone and pride is gone. Now, this is important because Paul here is saying, grace equals no pride. Amen. And this is going to be his theme throughout the rest of the, the chapter that we're about to read. So don't forget that part. Um, If we, if we don't do anything to get ourselves saved, how does that work? Um, I've shared this illustration before. I'm just going to put it back here in case you're new with us. Um, it's like the World Series, which I'm pretty sure is baseball, yeah? <laughs> Sports illustrations are not my, anyway, disclaimers out there. Um, so... Someone with a bat comes to what I believe is called a plate, and they're going to try to hit the ball out of the park, home run. That's what they want to do. Now, if it was you there during the World Series and you stepped up to that plate, what is your chance of hitting a home run in the World Series? Your personal chance. Give me a number. It's zero. It's zero for everybody in this room. You're not going to do it. Now, if God comes walking up in that moment and says, let me help you with that bat. Some of you went to Little League and you did all of that. and A, a good coach or a parent helped you swing that bat. You remember that? What if God walked up to you just like that and said, how about I help you with the next pitch? Now, what's your percentage of success? 100%. Good, you can do math. Absolutely. That's what it goes to. But when you do hit it, and when God allows you to hit it out of the park, what percentage of credit do you get? Back to zero. Because you didn't do it, he did. That's a picture of salvation. Now, does that mean that we don't have a choice in the matter? We absolutely have a choice in the matter. Because just like that little kid in Little League, you can say, no, thank you, I got this, coach. How many of you ever said that? I did. No, I'm, I'm a big boy. I got this. Uh, how many people will reject God in this lifetime because they will say to the Savior, I got this. I got my own salvation. I'll clean my own life up. I'm good enough on my own. And all of a sudden it starts to... Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's masterpiece. God has created us anew in Christ Jesus. This is the passage continuing to go on. So we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. That's Ergon again. So Paul said Ergon before. He said, your works are not what saves you. But now he flips it and says, but once you're saved, you're going to do works. But you're going to do works for a different reason. You're not going to do works to try to elevate yourself to God. You're going to do works out of gratitude to God. Amen. Because you love him now. 
because you're worshiping him now. It's a different kind of a picture. And then he says, you're his masterpiece. Uh, the Greek word there is poema. It's where we get our word poem. Do you know you're a poem of God's grace? That's what he calls you. You are a work of art in the sight of God. That's, that's absolutely in the text. Why? Because he's a story. He's a, he's a song. He, or you're a song, I'm sorry, um, that he's writing, that he's putting together. And, and this is what you were like before Jesus. And then Jesus did this in your life. And, and now this kind of change has been brought to your life because of Jesus. And that whole story is absolutely unique to you. And it glorifies God. And so you're a work of art, and that means you have purpose. And then he goes on to say that you're supposed to do good works that God prepared in advance at the very beginning of time for you to do. What's a word for that? Destiny. God has given you a destiny, not just a testimony, but the things that you're called to do before you die is your destiny. It's your purpose in this life. And God wrote it all out before the world began. What you uniquely as an individual were supposed to do. Some of you guys have, have been in this spot for, for maybe even a long time where you felt like you're spiritually in this valley and God's not done anything through you in a long time. Let me just say to you, if, you're, if you still have a pulse, you still have a destiny. Amen. If you have a pulse, you still got a purpose in this world. God's got things for you to do, which I think is a huge blessing. Now, everything up to this point in the passage has all been about our personal salvation and the personal benefits of that salvation. Even our personal pride has been in the, in the chapter. But he's about to turn it now, and it's not going to be about personal salvation anymore. It's going to be about salvation from the brokenness in our relationships. It's going to be about families now. It's going to be about denominations now. It's going to be about our society and how salvation heals that. Ephesians 2.11. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. Now, when he says Jews and Gentiles, the, the best way for you to think about this is in terms of religious and non-religious. Church people? And not so much church people. There was a brokenness between them. There was a pride. Do you see the pride in that passage? Between them. One of them said, we're religious. We know more about God. We do better things in our moral life than you do. And so we're better than you are. They were proud. Verse 12. And in those days, you were living apart from Christ, Gentiles. You were excluded. You were on the other side of the wall from citizenship among the people of Israel. And you did not know the covenant, the covenant promises that God made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. Verse 13. But now you've been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. That's a lot to unpack. Amen. Two groups of people, and they were separated in those times and still are, by the way. So here's how they were broken before. You had, you had Jews who had received the Old Testament and they received the covenants they received the promises. They received the sacrifices. They had received all of that. And yet they didn't do the stuff that they had received. Right? So they learned about it and they became experts. But they were not good at actually following the laws that God had given them. That's why they were all still in a broken place. But not only were they in a broken place but they still had pride about it somehow and they became Pharisees. And if you've read the gospels, you know all about them. But where, where did their ego come from? Their ego all came from the idea that we know God better than you. Maybe we're not perfect at it, but at, we, at least we know him better than you and you're not even trying. So we're on the inside and you're on the outside and there's a wall between us. And not only did they believe that, but there was a physical wall in the old temple in Jesus' day. 
The temple in Jerusalem that was there, even at the time of Paul's writing here. So he's got this in view when he talks about a wall of hostility. Like you would walk into the temple complex and if you were a good practicing Jewish person, you could walk fully into the temple and you could worship there. But if you were a Gentile or anything was wrong in your life, there was a four foot wall literally wrapped around the temple and you could not go past that as a Gentile. We actually have um, the historical plaques that were attached to that every so many feet across that whole wall that says, if you are a Gentile and you cross this wall, you will do so under pain of death. Capital punishment. So when Paul's talking about a wall of separation, he means it. And not only was the physical wall there, but the, the spiritual and the relational wall was there as well. There was, there was such an ego within the Jews at that time. We've got writings where they would, they would ask the question, why did God even make Gentiles? When we're so good and we're so perfect, why did God even make them? And the answer that they wrote down was, God had to um, light the fires of hell somehow. I'm not making this up. So, I mean, there, there wasn't a lot of love. You know what I mean? So broken in multiple ways between the religious and the non-religious um, it's interesting, uh, and, and we've seen this before, maybe growing up in the church or even outside of it, but church people can sometimes be this way. Uh, at least I know Jesus. At least I've got my Bible. At least I go to church. I'm failing at it. I'm not really following Jesus, but at least I go, and I got the Christian bumper sticker on my car to prove it, <laughs> Right? And so I feel all high and mighty over here, and at least I'm not like you people, and that makes me feel better. And then you've got the Gentiles or the non-church people over here, and they can see that hypocrisy a mile away because they're smart. At least we're smart enough to see the hypocrisy that's in you, and at least we are not hypocrites. And there they are separated from each other. And Jesus came down to break down that wall of hostility and bring Jew and Gentile, church and unchurch, back into one group of people. And that's not just good poetry. He actually did it. Jesus actually did it. And Paul's about to explain to you how all of that happened. But, but when he tore down the wall of hatred and hostility between those groups of people, what he was tearing down was pride. He was tearing down ego. Verse 15, he did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. And he made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself, that's Jesus, one new people from two groups. You could take that verse and you could study it for the next month. That's how massive that verse is. He comes and says, the only way that wall of pride could come down between people is Jesus had to come and he had to destroy the system of law itself. Now, some of you guys have read the rest of the scripture where you see Jesus didn't actually remove the law, he fulfilled the law. And when Jesus fulfilled the law, it no longer became the means by which I feel better about myself with God anymore. It doesn't give me any posture, it doesn't give me any rank, it doesn't give me any value. It only gives me blessing if I'm doing this out of gratitude again. But it certainly doesn't make me better than or more important than anybody else. So let's say we got two people in this room today. And let's say one of you uh, doesn't read the Bible very much. And you struggle to, and you wish you did more. Maybe the last time you cracked open the Bible was three, four, six months ago. And then we got somebody else who you're in the Bible every single day and you're, you're, you're doing quiet times and you're walking with God and, and you're just doing it so consistently and good for you. But realize, even though you might have some blessings with God speaking into your life and the closeness that you might experience, and those are good things, even though you are not at different ranks before God's throne. Amen. Neither of you is more important Neither of you is loved more because Jesus tore down the wall. He ended religion itself. And the way he did that 
The way he saved all of us and imputed his righteousness to us, it means that Jesus is up here and we're all down here level at the foot of the cross. Pride is gone. Pride is gone. Say pride is gone. Pride is gone. You kind of don't want to say it because you're like, but it's not. Pride is gone. It's, pride is gone. Jesus destroyed pride in truth. Jesus destroyed the very foundation of pride, the, the illusion that I was under, that I was somehow earning my way to God. And if I was earning my way better than you, that made me better than you or more important than you. Jesus destroyed all of that. He leveled us all down. So he, he destroyed it in truth, but we still experience pride all the time. And why do we do that? I, th I think God must look down on us with a bit of a smile on his face. I think that uh, the way that we must look to God with our big egos, uh, it must be humorous because he knows the truth and you know the truth, but you still puff yourself up anyway, don't we? Uh, I, I feel like we're, we're, we're like kids who are trying to act strong, blustery, we're like those ones who don't have any money in the bank, yet we're writing checks as if we do. And, and this is a lot of what we are. There's a, there's a movie. I wonder if you've ever seen this before. You remember him? You remember when Tom Hanks, the kid, walks up to the Zoltar machine and he speaks one of these classic movie lines, one of the, the best written things ever? He says what? I want to be big. He has one big wish that he can make to the Zoltar machine, and he says, I want to be big. If but God is a concise way to say the gospel of Jesus Christ, I want to be big is a very concise way to describe the human condition and why we keep doing what we do. Because we want to be big, and you're not giving me amens like I deserve up here. I'll just tell you that right now. <laughs> we like to punch above our weight. Um, we've preached on pride three times this year. Today's the third time. Even while I was going through this passage this week, I'm like, God, really? Pride again? Back in the spring, we looked at um, upside down kingdom and the fact that the top dogs are the top dogs wherever you look in this world. But when Jesus came to his disciples, he washed their feet and he made an upside down kingdom. And, and it was all about pride and ego and letting that go. And, and then I think it's maybe a month or so ago, we were finishing up Acts and I told you about King Herod and how he died because he took... Um, pride that wasn't his and, and, and praise that wasn't his. And, and man, we, we went in depth on pride and just really talking about it. Um, and many of you even came up to me after that particular message and just said how convicting that was for you personally about pride. So this week, here we are with pride again. Like, God, why? Um, and I think here's what's unique about today. Today is centering in on pride and saying, Pride doesn't just hurt us. Pride hurts each, uh, us as, a, as in each other. It, it hurts our marriage. Pride hurts the church. It hurts you and your kids. It's relationships. So today is, is how pride hurts your relationships. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I'm going to read you a quote from him. Um, he was a pastor in Germany around the time of World War II, and he was... He was uh, writing about churches and how they function. He wrote this little, little book called Life Together, and I'm reading it right now, and it's just brilliant stuff. But this is what he says. He says, a Christian community should know that somewhere in it, there will be reasoning among them which of them should be the greatest. And he's quoting Luke there, where the disciples were always arguing over who would be the greatest. It's our condition he says, there's no time to lose here for the first moment when a man meets another person, he is looking for a strategic position he can assume and hold over against that person. 
Okay, think about it for a second. It says, as soon as a Christian man walks in a room with another Christian man they've never met before, they say their names, what's the very next thing that they're going to say? What do you do for a living? And then it starts. I begin to posture myself. I begin to look for things. If I've got the resume of all of our attributes as men compared to each other, I'm going to look not just how I rank against you. I'm going to find the ones where I rank higher against you, and I'm going to drive the conversation into those directions. I want to be big. So I'm better. Um, I'm sober, and I don't have your voice, vices. Vices. I'm educated. I'm wealthy. And I've got a family tree that's better than your family tree. Right? Like those are the attributes I start to go to. Um, I'm prettier and more fit than you, clearly. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you're getting the sarcasm. Um, I have the right skin color and I've got the better accent than you do. Um, I'm married and you're not. I have kids and you don't. Uh, my car is better than yours for sure. Um, I never went to prison and you did. Um, I've never been divorced, and maybe you have been, and so maybe I'm going to drive the conversation into those areas because I'm going to feel better and higher when we're done. I'm a five-point Calvinist with a King James Bible. Some of you are getting, yeah. I'm a conservative and not a liberal in Oklahoma. <laughs> I speak in tongues and listen to Bethel worship. I'm an OU fan. Oh, come on. <laughs> I don't even know. Yeah, anyway. Um, how about this? We're, I'm DC, not Marvel. Get some of you. I'm Android, not Apple. Okay, 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 okay. The point is we do this, right? Like we walk in those conversations. Women, you do it too. And we're having this conversation and I'm posturing and I'm driving the conversation into different places. Do you ever do this? Do you ever, do you ever leave the conversation and then reflect and, and, and ask like, why did we end up talking about this? Like why, why did I work this uh, personal accomplishment of mine into the conversation? It actually didn't really fit, but I worked it in. Like why do I do that? We know why we do it. But isn't there such a thing as healthy self-respect? Of course there is. That's not what this is. There's healthy self-respect that has to do with like, okay, God, you've gifted me and you put value in me and that's good. But the conversation Bonhoeffer's talking about is I have to be stronger than you. I have to be higher than you. Well, that's not healthy self-respect. That's pride. And we do all of this without thinking we take the old wall that Jesus has destroyed and we build it back up in that one conversation. So these are the things that we do. Here's the solution. Philippians 2.5. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. Now, I just flipped over to another book called Philippians. Paul wrote it as well. But notice he's about to give you his advice. He's about to use the example of Jesus for you. And he's like, this is what solves it in your relationships. Be like Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, Jesus made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. He's saying Jesus didn't try to be higher than. And he actually had a right to be. The truth was actually on his side. Yet he lowered himself, yet he emptied himself even, because he was walking as our example. So not only did he destroy pride for all of us, but then he came as the example of humility. So how do we do this? We'll do what Jesus did. We've got to start emptying ourselves. Emptying ourselves of all of our qualifications, all of our higher thans. Let's be equal at the foot of the cross. Here's some ways that this works. I knew, I knew a mother and a grown daughter and they had been broken for years. And some things had gone down, never talked about. 
And they had just lived there as a brokenness in between them for years. And it was just, it was uncomfortable. It was, it was livable but uncomfortable. You know what I'm talking about. And eventually the mother learned about what was at the heart of all of this. And she went and found grown daughter and opened up and owned her part in all of it and apologized. You're like, is that a true story? Because that doesn't sound like a true story. It's a true story because God does incredible things in relationships if you open yourself up to it. Amen. And when, when she did that, when the mother did that, it didn't heal everything like some kind of light switch got thrown. What it did is it knocked down the wall between them and then the process of healing could start yeah. over years. But do you see how the mother in that case, she had to empty herself and make herself nothing. Had to. What was between them? They probably never would have said pride was between them, but it was. What kind of unforgiveness in your marriage? What kind of brokenness between you and your kids? What kind of financial debt that's going on in your house? It's all fueled by pride is what's underneath it. More stories. Ah, this is a Q&A with a pastor. I like this one. Uh, there's a, this starts to go into denominations and why churches are so broken. Um, so there was a Q&A. I, was, I, I got to listen in on with a pastor, and a seminary student asked the pastor a question. And she said, now that I've graduated seminary, every time I hear somebody else's sermon, all I can hear are their mistakes. And, and she's like, what do I do with that? And the wise pastor answered her. He's like, well, first off, discernment is a good thing, so keep discerning. Praise God that you've got some Bible knowledge. Praise God that you're being like the Bereans of old, and you're actually comparing what you hear from a pastor, and you're not swallowing everything. Can I get an amen? amen. Don't do that. Compare it to what the Bible says. That's good, and that's healthy. He's like, but... As soon as you start going down this road, there's a danger for pride. Yep. Because what you could find yourself doing is seeing one mistake and throwing the whole teacher out and saying, I don't have to listen to anything else that they have to say. And he gave her this quote by J.I. Packer, who's an amazing writer. J.I. Packer said, God loves to bless the needle of truth in a haystack of error. And the idea is, you might be able to pick up a Christian book that's got several problems in it, but God still might show you truths and very helpful things in that same Christian book, and that's okay. Sort it. Amen. Sort the bad this way and keep what's good, and it's okay. What about going to a church and listening to a pastor? It's like, well, I disagree with this, this particular doctrinal position they have over here. That's okay. There's a needle of error there. But is there a whole bunch of good? Maybe. And I know this messes with us. And it's like, well, sometimes there are things that people will say about Jesus or his word that are just so massive and they're majors, right? We, we can't be on the same. And I get that for sure. But most of the time, I wonder if we're making too big of a deal out of things and saying, I can't hear anything that this particular person says from this point on. This last year, we did His Name is Jesus, and we brought seven different churches, and some of them are from different denominations together, and we tried to do a thing together, God help us. Amen. And I had certain people come and ask me questions about some of the other churches and saying, Pastor, do you, are you aware that they do X, Y, or Z? And I said, yeah, I am doesn't mean we can't be unified because they've got this thing wrong. And I agree with you. They've got that thing wrong for sure. But it's not a major. Right, they've got that thing wrong. It doesn't mean I can't be brothers and sisters with them. Okay. It doesn't mean we can't do things together. I've, I've talked with other pastors in his name is Jesus who have come to me and they've told me some of their stories where people have come to them and to their elderships and said, you can't be aligned with Grace Fellowship because there's some things at Grace Fellowship that we don't agree with. And that pastor, God bless him, had to stand in that moment and say, nope, 
we're going to stay unified. And yeah, I agree. There's some things that maybe we don't agree with, but there's so much that we do. God loves to bless the needle of truth and the haystack of error. Um, All right, now I'm really going to mess with you because I haven't yet. I'm a Protestant. Does that mean I can't look at my Catholic brothers and sisters and see beauty in their faith? Does that mean I can't receive challenge from some things in their faith that God might bring into my life and bless me with? Just something to think about. A couple more stories. Um, Two of my kids. Um, we saw them come into the teenage years and have some real conflict. Two of them, just their, their two personalities were just not on the same wavelength, if you know what I'm saying, and just very, very different. And there was just always conflict. And at one point, and I don't know how it happened, but at one point, um, they decided, we've got to work this out. I watched them do it. It probably took them a year, maybe a year and a half. What it turned into was every single time that they disagreed, they'd go off in a bedroom somewhere and they would hash it out and they would talk for hours and hours and hours. And it, it, it so slowly came together. But they worked it out. And they did the work to be together. And I honor them um, Because in every single hour they spent together trying to work through that stuff, you know what they were saying to each other just by their presence and just by that work is you matter enough to work through this. It's worth the emotion. It's worth the hurt. It's worth the anger. It's worth all of it because you're worth it. And they had to let down their walls, yeah? They had to empty themselves. Empty themselves of what? Well, in most of our conversations, don't we walk into them saying, the problem here is that you don't understand me and you need to work harder at understanding me. And if you worked harder at understanding me, then we'd be okay. They had to lay that down, didn't they? These two teenagers had to. Had to commit to themselves. Maybe today, it's gonna be worth it that I understand them. One of them reached out to me several months back and they were seeing two of their friends at this point in their adult life that were in conflict and they said dad they just don't get it they've got to do the work and they're not willing to do the work and I'm like the only person that could have taught you that was the Lord praise God praise God I saw two people on a ministry team here at Grace and there was a massive conflict between them and there was there were some actions that were taken there was some hurt and I was honored blessed to be in the room with them when they talked it through and and one of them just gave them the full highly detailed version of how they were hurt by them and then I watched this other person stop look them in the eye and own it and apologize right here in this church. And when I saw that, I saw forgiveness and healing come in. So I'm just telling you miracles about what God does in this church. People lay down their pride. Don't build up the wall that Jesus tore down. Somebody needs some help from our church and they filled out one of our forms And I lost the form, which if you know me is not a big shock. And several weeks went by and it came back to my mind and I reached back out to the person. This was actually a person outside of our church. I had never even met them before. And I'm sitting there and I'm writing the the message to them and I'm basically just trying to describe to them the situation of how it, got, how it happened and, and all this kind of stuff. And get to the place where I forgot and I'm just staring at the screen because I don't want to write that part. And I finally get that sentence out. And then it comes to the spot where it's like, well, the right thing for me to do is apologize. 
in this dumb email to a person I've never even met before. And can you hear my ego starting to rise up? I made all the arguments there at that laptop on why I shouldn't write an apology to this person. I don't know how long it took, <laughs> but I finally wrote it and I finally sent it off. And it's like an hour later and I'm like, of course I needed to write an apology. Why did I wrestle it so much? Why did it seem so wrong? Why was it like lifting a ton just, just to get that, that, that sentence? It, I'm still broken. I still wrestle with this. Do you wrestle today? Why don't you guys stand? Here's what you're praying for. The way I see this is the Holy Spirit has got his arm outstretched to you and he's offering you a gift. He's offering you a gift called humility. Will you take it today? You gotta want it, but he's offering you that gift. And here's how it works. You've got to agree with him that your sin rap sheet is so long and your guilt is so deep that you have lost all rights. You don't have a right to anything before God. You don't have worth on your own. And then you agree that Jesus came and gave you value. That Jesus came and wiped the slate clean for you. But when you get to the end of that World Series swing, your deserving is at 0% because he did it all, not you. And that kind of conviction about your whole world and your whole life, it's got to come into your marriage. It's got to come in between you and your kids. It's got to come into your workplace. It's got to come into every avenue of your life because that's you living the truth, maybe for the first time. Every relationship you've got in your life right now that's broken, ask yourself, ask the Holy Spirit this morning, is the brokenness, is the wall between us, is it pride? It likely is. Do you have the courage to reach out and to see that? If you take his gift, I will just tell you, you will experience the greatest peace that you've ever experienced before. Amen. Things will be settled in your heart and your life that have never been settled before. Because so much about your life has been about you reaching and trying to get more of that status, let it go. There's peace there your relationships are going to experience more healing than you've ever seen before because you're going to lay down your weapons and then the joy is going to come in. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, aren't you good? Lord, there's so many broken things amongst us today, Lord, and every situation is different. And Lord, I'm not even going to try and call them out anymore because I know your Holy Spirit is whispering in the ears of everybody sitting here, everybody that's online right now, God, they're hearing him too. And God, you're whispering into our ears, this is the broken thing. You've got to lay it down. Lord, that we would empty ourselves. God, that you would heal us. May it be, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.